All right, hello everybody. Um, like Jos already said, my name is Ruben. I work at Spindle, and I have casted the wrong desktop, so I will <laughs> I will switch that real quick. That's a great start. <laughs> okay, well, there's a lot of pictures anyway, so there's not a lot of text, so I'll just uh, get going. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how we test our infrastructure code, and how we continuously try to do this. But before I do that, I want to take you back to the past. I want to take you back to the time where we had computer wizards with giant neck beards typing away at green lit terminals making the worlds of technology work that we know and live in today. And I'm talking about guys like Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson, inventors of C and godfathers of Unix. These kind of sys admins were at the forefront when it came to uh, uh, trying to advance the field of system administration. Um, but there was an issue with the way that they did their their work, and most of the sysadmins at the time did their work. And that was that even the greatest computer wizards can be slain by a Balrog of Morgoth. And what happens when your sysadmin gets attacked by a Balrog, and he dies, and only comes back to movies later? Well, then you have a problem. Because your system admins, they're the only ones who know how your infrastructure works. If you have just one or two people that know this and leave the company for whatever reason or something happens with them, then you have an issue maintaining your infrastructure and developing new features for it. We sometimes also call this the bus factor, but let's call it the bell rock factor to stay in this, uh, in, this in this realm. And the idea is that if you have a bus factor of let's say one, so there's uh, one person that knows about your infrastructure and he gets hit by a bus tomorrow, you will be in trouble. So there are some obvious downsides to this, which you cannot read, so I'll just delve into you. <laughs> <laughs> the single point of failure is the sysadmin itself in this system. The knowledge about infrastructure is, is centralized, which is never a good, uh, good thing. And most importantly for me, it's not reproducible. Because if something happens at two o'clock uh, uh, in, in the evening on Saturday, you have to then call your sysadmin, or hopefully the sysadmin will get a call, and will have to then fix everything manually. So there are some modern day solutions to fix this. It's called configuration management, or also sometimes referred to as infrastructure as code. Um, some of the frameworks are listed here, like SaltStack, Chef, Ansible, and Puppet. There are others, but these are the main ones that are being used today. And the idea behind configuration management is real simple. We want to have our infrastructure defined in source files so that if something happens, people can read those source files and reproduce what happens. It's basically a set of steps which you can apply to a server in order to reproduce the exact same results over and over and over again. And this is great, because if something happens and somebody throws your server out of a window, you have a program you can run and set up the exact same piece of infrastructure that was failing on you. So there are some benefits to that. You have a reproducible way to build your infrastructure. And because it is defined in source code, everyone can see how the system works. Everybody knows where the files are, what services are running. Uh, what binaries you're downloading. And because it is in source code, you can do a lot of awesome software engineering things, like versioning your infrastructure. So for example, you deploy a new version of your infrastructure, shit breaks, you can then roll back to a previous version of your infrastructure, and everything will be fine again until you fix that issue that came up. Uh, today I'm going to be talking mainly about SaltStack, because that's the tool that we use at Spindle internally. And uh, SaltStack has a very simple model. It has a master minion model, 
where the master can issue commands to its minions, and the minions can be anything. It could be a virtual machine, it could be a piece of hardware that you're running somewhere, a Docker container, just anything that can communicate with your salt master, basically. And a salt master can then, uh, over a variety of servers, uh, issue these commands, like for example, it could ask all the minions, what is your disk usage? Can you run this command for me? So that if you have a big fleet of servers, you can very easily uh, uh, issue commands to them and put them in certain states. Um, salt has something called grains, and grains are nothing more than labels that are applied to minions. So for example, we have Bob, and Bob has a label name, which is Bob. And we can very easily, on our command line, on our salt master, say that we want to set the grain name Bob. Very simple. But it's also very powerful because then, in your salt stack code, you can make decisions based on these labels. So if you have a set of servers that do web server things or do database things, you can then distinguish those in the code that you're writing for it. Then there's another concept which is called a pillar. It's unfortunate that you can't see the code right now, but it's basically uh, a set of data that is stored on the salt master itself. So the salt master has a treasure chest, usually of secrets, because then you don't have to distribute all of your secrets to the minions that you have, but you can individually target the minions and say, you are a web server, I only want you to have the secrets that are needed for the web server to work. You are a database server, I only want you to have those secrets. And you can define that in your salt stack code, who gets what. And now I wanted to do a little bit of a demo, and that never goes well, so let's see how this goes. Especially with the, with the screen not working really nice. Wow. <laughs> We have some source code. Yay. Okay. Um, so the idea for SaltStack is that it has states that you can apply and run on your servers. This is a very, very basic one. We are calling the package.installed module of SaltStack and we are installing a package. But this is not programming yet, right? I mean, it's just the configuration that you run on your server. But what if we introduce variables? We have a templating language called Jinja, and within Jinja we can define uh, uh, variables, we can loop over things, uh, and do if statements, all those kind of things. Uh, and here we set a variable called package name and then use that to then render our states with. But I was also talking about the grains, so how would that look for using <coughs> grains? Well, it's very simple, you just use the grains module and say I want to have a certain grain, here it says, if my grain is, if, if I have an OS of Ubuntu, I want to install Vim, and otherwise I want to install Linux. If I'm going too fast or if you have questions, please raise your hand. Then we have the pillar, like I uh, told you about earlier. We can do the same, so we can get the value from the salt master instead of from the minion itself, and then install the package that way. And that would look like this. So this is our pillar file, where we have to find the variable package name, which we're then injecting into our salt state. But we need a way to distribute this as well, and this is where our top file comes in. Our top file is basically a manifest in where we say what uh, uh, minions can have what values in order to uh, do the things that they do. And here we have to find that asterisk so all of the minions have the pillar file that I just showed you. 
We have the same for our salt states. This is basically the top file, the manifest for what all of our servers are going to be lo going to look like, what salt states are going to be ran on them. So all of the servers will have the all packages salt state, but only the server named Bob will have all packages, and only the server named Alice will have Alice packages. And those salt states, I'm just going to show you just for now, look like this. So it's a little for loop over the, the pillar I just showed you. It gets the packages and then installs these. Alice likes Vim, so she installs Vim. And Bob likes Emacs, so he installs Emacs. Not trying to spark any religious discussion, so <laughs> please refrain from those. But you could say this is this is one step of it. This is just you writing codes. How am I now going to apply this or how am I going to test this? And this is where um, another tool comes in called Kitchen. Um, Kitchen was originally written for a configuration management system called Chef. Uh, Chef is written in Ruby, so it's a bit of a sacrilege to present this uh, at Python, but I'm going to get to the py Python part real quick. Um, and Kitchen is a tool that basically allows you to instantiate um, virtual machines uh, through VirtualBox on your own machine, or through spinning up an Amazon instance, or uh, a digital ocean droplet, or whatever platform uh, you want, basically. It then takes your configuration management files, applies them to it, and gives you a way to SSH into them, debug them, uh, and, and have all kinds of cool manual stuff. So I'll show you that right now. <laughs> I So I'm in my salt set directory right now. I can use a kitchen command to see what instances I can create. And this is all based on our kitchen YAML file. I've defined that I want to use Vagrant in order to spin up a virtual box mm -hmm. image. I have two uh, virtual box images. Mm -hmm. I have a Debian 8 image and a Debian 9 image. I'm provisioning that with the salt states that I've just showed you. So I'm giving it some arguments for that. And I'm setting some grains that I could use in my files in order to do some debugging, for example. And then I define the suites itself. So this is where you would define your uh, audio infrastructure. For example, your web server, what grains would have to be set there in order to get the desired results. So Bob has a server named Bob. Alice has a server named Alice and that will then install the packages that they need. Um, and with Kitchen, I've already created one of them because like them was never built well, as you can probably see. Um, so what I, what I can do is I can converge the other one. And converge basically means give me a virtual box instance, put our solid states on that, and then return back to me. So I can go into that. So I'll do that, and we'll start talking with Vagrant, we will start booting up the box, transferring all of the GBG keys, all the salt state files, and then applying them. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to log into another box that I've got already set up. So I could log into, could log into a box and show you how So we can see here that it is running. We have virtual box image. That's all working. <laughs> Again, great preparation from my side, I guess. 
But uh, the idea is basically you can manually log in through an SSH session into these instances you just created and then start manually debugging it. So see, are uh, the patches that I want to install there? Are the services running that I wanted there? Um, and have that be available for, uh, for yourself. But there's still a step missing there, and that is the tests, because we don't want to, every time we change our code, go into our uh, boxes and then manually try and see are the services running and all that stuff. So this is where the Python comes in, yay. Um, we have a tool called PyTest, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And PyTest has a great module called uh, Test Infra, which basically gives you an interface to ask, ask all kinds of questions about your infrastructure. Uh, so is it package installed, is it service running, is it port missing, <coughs> all, the, all those kind of things. And with just a little bit of Python, we can connect to our host. It uses the kitchen um, environment variables to do that and inserts the SSH keys. I've got a little fixture that I can use in my test to return that host, make it easy. And uh, let's see the test that I wrote. So here we have a test for Bob, and Bob wanted the Emacs package installed. So we can then say, test Emacs install, search host package, Emacs is installed. So it looks like a, a, a nice little DSL that you have around uh, making sure that your infrastructure is in the right state. And the great thing about this is that you can automate this with other systems. So if you have different uh, uh, um, pieces of infrastructure running and you change something in system A, it could break something in system B. But you won't know that until you actually deploy it and things start breaking. But with a tool like this, you can run all of your tests, so all of the instances, and then see, did my change break anything in, all of, in any of these other instances? So you don't want your database breaking while you're updating your web server, for example. Let's see. This is not good. No, I don't think Bob wants to come out today and play. <laughs> but uh, basically with, uh, with a simple command called kitchen verify, you can then run the tests on the machine itself. Uh, and it all kind of ties together into uh, the flow that Kitchen has. So for example, you could just say Kitchen test my, my box or my instance, and it will build it, it will uh, uh, converge it, so put all the salt states on it, and then run all of the tests that you've, uh, you've actually written for it. Ah, Bob is doing something, great. Right, so now we are inside a ball, which sounds pretty awful. <laughs> 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 uh, so, for example, we could say, is the Emacs package that he wants, is, he, uh, is it installed? Well, we can say it's, all, it's already installed, version 46.1. Great, that looks fine, but we don't want to do this manually, like I said. We want to actually run the test and verify that ball actually has it. And as you can see, the test that I just showed you passed. So that's great. And you can uh, uh, tie this in with, for example, CI, which is what we're doing. So every time that we push to a master branch uh, or one of our release branches, uh, a process on GitLab will start running and it will test all of our instances and then report back on Slack to see, hey, did anything break? With what commit did it break? How does it work? And that's how we keep our infrastructure, or try to keep our infrastructure as impervious as possible. And that was my talk, so thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. Um, with the market moving towards uh, functions as a service, and with things like Kubernetes and Docker, uh, taking over a lot of the configuration part as well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see stuff like this uh, having its place within the development uh, platform? Uh, I, I don't have a lot of experience with function as a service. So th the question, just to repeat it, is uh, we're moving to uh, function as a service. How does it work with Kubernetes and Docker and all that stuff? How does this tie, tie into that? Um, 
So I don't really have experience with function as a service, but I know that, for example, Kitchen can work with Docker instances. So you could create a Docker image and then test that using, uh, using Kitchen. Any other questions? Yeah, so the question is, can we do integration tests? Can we do multiple uh, uh, nodes talking to each other? And the answer, sadly, is not right now. Uh, it's more of unit tests that you're doing on these boxes, uh, uh, rather than actually having the network configuration and everything set up. Um, but I'm sure there's somebody clever enough to figure that, that stuff out. So. Yeah, what, how does uh, Kitchen talk to the min? By that data, do you mean the Kitchen find them in the min? Yeah, so Kitchen is a Ruby gem, um, and it talks to your uh, instances through um, Vagrant. So it spins it up with Vagrant, and then it gives you an SSH key back, which you can then use to, to log into the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in this situation, we're setting up uh, uh, an instance from basically the ground up, but oftentimes it's much more interesting to see if if what happens when you upgrade the previous version to the new one. Like, do you have tests for that with Kitchen? Or? Um, what we kind of do, like a little cheat, um, is every time we have a new base system, basically, uh, we build a new VirtualBox image and then use that in our, in our testing. Um, so we kind of have that. I don't think it's like between actual two different versions of your infrastructure, but you could add that to your suites and say, I want to. Uh, I want to have uh, a different grain set, so something else will happen in my states, for example. Yeah. I just want to mention that uh, you don't have to need, uh, you don't have to use uh, Kitchen to use test infra. The company I work for, we have a, a bare metal network, which is automatically rolled out, and just test infra and pytest test uh, gives you the opportunity to test everything on every node or minion yeah. what you want, and then salt stack is used for the backend. Yeah, so yes, you don't have to use uh, Kitchen in order to do the test infra stuff. Uh, it's just kind of a wrapper around trying to create those instances and then work with those. Yeah. Do you know if, if uh, Kitchen uh, does support bare metal deployments or only VMs? Um, I haven't tried it myself yet, so I'm not 100% I'm not sure, but I would assume so. Yeah. Any other questions? Guy in the back. Um, for example, if you do, I know, well, uh, I know about Ansible, and the rule in Ansible is that you define your infrastructure in the dependent way, so that anytime you run the same uh, script, I would say, the results will be all, must be always the same. Yes. And if it's not true, it's a problem in the script and not in the, in the infrastructure. Yes. So, and it's also sort of embedded way to test whether your code uh, in the Ansible playbook script name uh, is correct or not. Yeah. So uh, that way, well, actually, I, I tested my Ansible script. So on cron, just execute everything. And if something breaks, so basically it means that there is a bug uh, in the playbook. Uh, but when do you decide that you need to use test infra in your case? Um, for so source? What, what is the reason I need to use Yeah, w w when did we switch to this, you mean? But why, why did we start using this? Um, for us, salt stack makes it very difficult to locally develop your, um, your states because if you want to render them, you need to have some kind of salt master running somewhere and applying the states somewhere. So it's different from Ansible where you just have your, um, your own laptop that talks through SSH to another server. Um, so that's kind of why we needed to start using uh, 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 Kitchen and Test Infra to make sure that at least before you push it to some branch, we can verify that the syntax is correct, for one, which is most important, I think, <laughs> and two, if it actually uh, uh, does what you, you want it to do before having to test that on a dev environment where all of your other colleagues are playing around in as well. I was wondering how do you bootstrap this because your master machine seems very complicated. How do you test things there? 
Uh, I don't understand the question. Well, if, you, if you test your minions, right? Yes. And you and you profit in your minions. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? Do you do is something similar for your master node, as it were? Like um, at some point you need that like yeah. Yeah, we file that instructs a person to do something, right? Yes, we, we have uh, we also have salt states for our salt master. Because okay. salt has uh, the option to um, execute commands without having to have a salt master uh, in place. If it just has the salt states in the pillar files and all that kind of stuff, it can do it with a salt call command. Um, so you don't need that salt master to do that. That's, that's also how Kitchen works, because you don't have, you don't spin up a salt master and then it talks to those other minions. It's just executing those, those states. So uh, the salt states, you need to have, you need to have a salt executable on the minions, right? Um, yes. So You would use yeah, if you wanted to talk, if you wanted to talk to a Docker container with this, you would indeed have to install uh, salt on it, yeah. <coughs> and that loads your Docker image. So if that's not for you, then oh, I see you. Newer versions have proxy, so you can install it on the host that can connect with the container or to the to the uh, Docker engine to talk into the uh, the container itself. Okay. So you can proxy into different machines or different structures or even network devices. So that can, you know. Nice. I didn't know that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what I find interesting with unit testing is uh, it's usually pretty difficult to uh, to not let the unit test be basically a repetition of the definition. How would you? Uh, because well, in your definition you said Bob should have emails, and then your test specified Bob should have emails, which is kind of a, it feels like a useless unit test. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very simple example, obviously. Um, but once you start introducing a lot of other factors that interact with your system, um, <coughs> tests like this can break and have broken for us in the past as well. Could you give an example of that? Um, Let's see. Um, we have um, no, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Configuration where engine would start, for example, would be a bit Right. Yeah. So, so an engine configuration, for example, that's not correct and therefore can't can start itself. Yeah. Anybody else? No. Oh, just one more. Um, do you mean inside of the, 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 the box or on your own local system? Uh, no, inside the box. Uh, on the box itself, of course you need to have SSH in order to do those tests over, um, but I think that's, uh, that's about it. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's some magic that uh, sends over some data to the box to test that checks whether everything is correct and then can put it back? Like um, Ansible does? Yeah, I think so. I'm not 100% sure. Okay. If there's no more questions, then thank you for paying attention.